Um, so yeah, welcome to everybody. Great to see you all. Um, and like I just said a little minute ago, that I hope that this will be a good session and we'll feel refreshed afterward, afterwards. Um, at the moment, actually, I'm down in Busterton, so I will say that I'm not on Wajaknunga uh, land, but I'm actually on the Wandandi country. I always wanted to be able to say sometime that I'm in another, in another country, and today I can, so I have to tell you. <laughs> and, but yes, UWA is situated on the Wajaknunga land, and we do acknowledge their elders, past and present. Um, this week we do welcome Gillian Tan to our seminar and she'll be presenting on her research. Um, Paddy, you still ready to introduce her, I believe. Thank you. Um, so delighted to have Gillian here with us today. So many of you will know her already, but um, Gillian is a senior lecturer in anthropology at DECA. Um, her research examines contemporary social and environmental changes on the Tibetan plateau with a particular focus on human non-human relationships among Tibetan nomadic pastoralists, um, as well as the theoretical and practical intersections between ecology and religiosity. She's currently part of a large multidisciplinary ARC discovery project investigating Tibet's rivers that will produce an ethnographic and environmental history of waterways in the third pole framed within a specific articulation of climate change. Um, her paper today, as I understand it, stems very much from this project and it's entitled Tibet's Rivers, Narratives, Connections and Value in the Upper Yangtze. And thank you so much, Julian, for joining us. And it is a bit of a slightly awkward moment. So um, we're really grateful that you're, that you're here with us to talk to us about beautiful things for a change. <laughs> Not at all, Katie. Thanks so much um, to you and really to everyone um, present, especially those of you at UWA. Uh, I um, have already said a few things, but it really um, strikes to heart, I think, um, uh, for everyone here, colleagues in anthropology and in sociology across the, across the states. Um, and I, I'm actually very, very grateful to all of you uh, for finding it in yourselves to, to come today uh, together and, and to listen um, to, to my paper. I've sort of adapted it a little bit, um, as I said to Katie, I, I thought maybe I would focus, focus a bit more on ritual propitiations to the, to the Lu, which are the uh, watery worldly beings um, as, as a way, as an offering, I suppose, uh, to all of you uh, for the, the difficulties that you're going through. Um, and as Katie said, the, the work today is part of um, a current ARC discovery project that I'm on. Um, this project is a, a multidisciplinary investigation of Tibet's rivers in the context of the climate crisis. Um, for me, in fact, it's been an enlightening experience working with surface water hydrologists, uh, a paleoecologist, um, as well as historians and Tibetan studies scholars as we pull together our various expertise and data sets. So, you know, ice core samples, get that, uh, monsoon variability analyses, um, in addition to classical Tibetan texts and Himalayan ethnographies. Um, so what I'll present today is part of my contribution to this project, um, but I'm always, as usual, very happy to answer any questions about the project um, that you might have at the end of the paper. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to do fieldwork in 2019, and this is prior to COVID-19. Um, uh, so this, uh, this paper is, in, in a sense, um, my first sort of pulling together of uh, some of the, that material. But first, some preliminary remarks from me to begin this presentation. And I thought uh, also that I'd, um, rather than have you just look at me, <laughs> um, that, uh, ooh, where is my, oh dear, where's my uh, PowerPoint? It's not showing. Hi, Richard. That's all right. Um, I'm just trying to find my PowerPoint now. I'm having a bit of a, a panic moment where, because I can't see it. It was open, but maybe I need to open it in a different way. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. You'd think that I'd have got used to Zoom by now, having done as many Zooms <laughs> as we've all had to do. Um, here we go. And I thought rather than have you looking at me the whole time, you, I'd show you a lovely picture. <laughs> and, and there, that's much better. Uh, a lovely picture of a Tibetan river at 4,200 meters above sea level. Okay, what is the value of a river? I start here because it's the question that framed Lansing's seminal article in political e ecology titled The Value of a River, which described the competing interests of a hydropower company and an Indian tribe towards the Skokomish River in western Washington state, USA. 
The Skokomish tribe engaged with the river and its resources in such a way that the river influenced kinship-based residence patterns, wealth exchanges, and ritual practices, even after the consolidation of traditional villages into a reservation in 1859. Nevertheless, the damming of the northern fork of the Skokomish River and construction of a hydropower plant in the 1920s and 30s significantly disrupted the flow of the river and impacted both resources, such as fish, shellfish, various river, river grasses, and the riverine environment, including sediment deposition. Energy needs and economic value clearly displaced indigenous needs and ecological value. And I think this is a trope that uh, should be familiar to many of us here. Yet rather than leave the conclusion in such starkly dichotomous terms, Lansing and his co-authors suggested that reframing the river as natural capital would place the tribe's engagement with the river in terms understandable to modern frames of value. Doing so could make the tribe better able, for example, to seek redress and compensation in courts of law because designating the river as natural capital provided a comparative estimate of value in a world dominated by economic capital. In this regard, Lansing's conclusion foreshadows one other approach in the management of competing interests toward the natural environment. Ecosystem services present a view that natural ecosystems through air and water, as well as the role of organisms in energy and material cycles, underpin human quality of life and in a fundamental way. According to Bob Wesson, who headed the UK's first ecosystem services assessment in 2011, quote, putting a value on these natural services enables them to be incorporated into policy in the same way that other factors are. We can't persist in thinking of these things as free, close quote. The transformation of nature into Earth Inc., that is, an ecosystem services company that provides quantifiable and tradable resources for the right price, in some ways echoes the move most famously proposed by Lévi-Strauss to the French National Assembly in 1976 to assign rights of the living. And I want to stress here that the similarity in moves that I'm seeing or I'm making a point of isn't a moral maneuver, but a logical one based on categories of action, namely transposing human action and value onto the natural world, right? So economic price, legal rights. Levi-Strauss, by enlarging the concept of rights to encompass all living beings, was concerned by the irreparable void to creation that would result from the extinction of any species. As Erin Fitzhenry has observed in relation to this, quote, such rights would mean that humans could not just wantonly wipe out whole ecosystems or species without being charged with something akin to genocide, close quote, since the rights of mankind stop whenever and wherever their exercise imperils the existence of another species. Hence, we have in more recent times and following Christopher Stone's advocacy work, legal rights of personhood now being granted to nature, for example, in Ecuador, to mountains and lakes in New Zealand and North America, and to rivers in New Zealand, India, Colombia, and possibly even Australia. It appears now that individually allotted value through rights is pushing back against blanket environmental exploitation. One wonders, nevertheless, if that's enough. Now, perhaps more than other topographical aspects of the environment, such as mountains, rivers have tended to be understood both in the real world and in academic literature in terms of their use value. In other words, they have been approached mainly as means, means of transport, livelihood, governance, irrigation, hydropower, you know, etc. And specifically then as instrumental means. Now, approaching and understanding rivers as means shouldn't carry, I, I don't think, it does carry an automatically negative judgment. Because if we did so, we could end up with a situation of, well, how long is a piece of string? Or in this case, when is a river not understood as means? Even when we take the Tibetan case of some rivers as abodes of watery worldly beings known as Lu, and ritual cleansing of the headwaters as a means to appease the anger of the Lu. 
So we won't go down that path, but rather I suggest a more fruitful way comes from reframing the question into what kind of means. I think that by probing this more carefully, we may arrive at greater clarity on the value of a river and what more there is apart from use value. Yet at the same time, in thinking through my Tibetan material on rivers, the more than is not, as some post-humanist literature emphasizes, the personification or agency of rivers. In this way, Buddhist Tibet is very different from Hindu India, which personifies the Ganga as Mother Ganga and Goddess. Doubtless, watery worldly beings known as Lu live in the headwaters of these streams and rivers. They are personified through physical descriptions in ritual texts. I'll, I'll actually read some of that later. And are subject to the purity or pollution of anthropogenic activities and subsequently gratified or angered by these. Yet they are not themselves synonymous with the river, nor even usually identified with it. Um, they are more actually identified with the quality of water at a particular place. So within the Tibetan context, it doesn't even make much sense to say that, quote, rivers are fundamentally social in nature, close quote, as has been suggested in the introduction to a recent ANU press collection titled Island Rivers. By making this statement, the collected authors claim that it's possible to treat rivers as subjects rather than objects of anthropological inquiry. I'll have more to say about this in the conclusion, uh, but first I'd like to further clarify the question of what kind of means. Now the following quote from Heidegger's essay, The Question Concerning Technology, is pretty long, but I think appropriate to pursue this line of thinking. He's writing about the Rhine. The hydroelectric plant is set into the current of the Rhine River. It sets the Rhine into supplying its hydraulic pressure, which then sets the turbines working. This turning sets those machines in motion, whose thrust sets going the electric current for which the long distance power station and its network of cables are set up to dispatch electricity. But the hydroelectric plant is not built into the Rhine River as was the old wooden bridge that joined bank with bank for hundreds of years. Rather, the river is dammed up into the power plant. What the river is now, namely a water power supplier, derives from out of the essence of the power station. In order that we may even remotely consider the monstrousness that reigns here, let us ponder for a moment the contrast that speaks out of the two titles, the Rhine as dammed up into the power works and the Rhine as uttered out of the artwork in Holderlin's hymn of by that name. But it will be replied, the Rhine is still a river in the landscape, is it not? Perhaps, but how? In no other way than as an object on call for inspection by a tour group ordered there by the vacation industry, close quote. So the key here with this quote is the setting upon, right? The kind of instrumentality towards the Rhine or any other object that is the focus of modern technology. The setting upon is a kind of ordering wherein an object exists or is revealed to us only insofar as it is a supply that can be extracted and stored. In this regard, setting upon registers a particular kind of instrumentality, which differentiates it from previous use, the old wooden bridge. In another example, Heidegger writes of a field that is plowed by a farmer. The series of actions included in this process is not a setting upon, whereas mechanized agriculture cultivates a field as a setting upon. Right, the difference lies between the availability of an object as means, right, the field is a means to provide crops and food that does not obscure other ways that the object is available to us. That's the first case. And then the entire orientation of an object as and only as resource for us. Of course, in this latter sense, even the Rhine or the field is still always an object, but this dimension is concealed when it's set upon. That's Heidegger's entire point about this. So in other words, the setting upon reveals an object only in a certain way. When such occlusion occurs, that object becomes standing reserved. 
Now we know that historically rivers have been widely used and manipulate, manipulated by centralized structures of power, kingdoms, empires, states, um, in, a, in order to provide a variety of means, right? First, agriculture um, and irrigation, such as in the Fertile Crescent um, through flood irrigation, but also in Zhujiangyan in Sichuan province, China, um, during the third century BCE through a system of weirs. So all of this was irrigation constructed um, for agriculture. Culture. Also, rivers have been manipulated um, and used as transport for the movement of people and goods, such as through the creation or the construction of the Miracle and Grand Canals built on the Yangtze during the 3rd century BCE, that's for the Miracle Canal, and also from um, 600 AD to 1300 AD, that's the Grand Canal that really goes um, northwards from the Yangtze um, all the way up through um, Beijing. And then also as means um, of livelihoods provided by fishing for communities that in many ways were created by and supported such projects. So I suppose all of this is just pointing out that yes, rivers have always had a, a really central role um, in uh, how centralized structures of power have um, maintained and augmented um, their ability to rule. Uh, Stuart, Julian Stuart, has written about the role of water in ancient civilizations and more famously, Wittfogel introduced the idea of hydraulic civilizations, those kingdoms and empires that could direct and dispose of a large foundation of enforced labor to redirect water either for productive uh, measures such as irrigation for agriculture or for protective measures such as uh, for flood control. Perhaps in this albeit controversial thesis lay the basis for a certain kind of use value to be attached to rivers, but it is arguably modern technology that has literally concreted the case. The construction of weirs and other small scale dams as well as canals while managing the flow, direction and collection of water did not set upon the river as subsequent efforts to channel the force of the river towards hydropower plants. So with modern technology, and I would add here the important role of 19th century Portland cement and subsequently concrete, modern states have been able to set upon rivers in unprecedented ways. So the rectification of the Rhine embarked in the 1800s by the engineer Johannes Tula, which basically straightened the river in order to turn it into a canal. So they literally got rid of branches, as you can see here, right, and, and basically um, straightened the Rhine uh, in order to turn it into a canal, and therefore um, ease the, the movement and, and transport of people and trade. Um, is That's a case in point. And certainly what China is trying to do now with regard to mega dams, uh, and that is as a general rule, those dams that are at least 50 meters high and capable of generating over 400 megawatts of uh, power on average, is another example of this setting upon China, uh, because we will be talking more about China, and the Yangtze River is home to the world's largest dam, the Three Gorges, uh, with capacity to produce 18 gigawatts of power on average. And I had to check these numbers, um, but there are over 50,000 dams along the Yangtze River Basin as we speak, and more and more are being constructed, all in order to, um, to uh, try to meet, not even satisfactorily meet, but try to meet the demands of uh, China's rising energy needs. So all these efforts to set upon rivers carry ramifications, mainly negative, um, and these ramifications are to the riverine environments, even though hydropower is often touted as a better, better energy alternative to fossil fuels. Dams not only block the water flow of rivers, but they also stop sediments from being carried and deposited along the course of a river. Such blockages negatively impact fish species and other forms of life within and along the river and create a host of problems with regard to water quality, rates of evaporation, and most importantly, disrupting the cycle of floods that often regenerates these riverine environments. So the scorecard is in on dams and it is damming. 
managing riverine environments as a means to achieve sustainability and reverse the damage of human interference is sometimes undertaken by governments themselves and often research from a scientific perspective. Um, and in this way, therefore, environmental management of rivers um, increasingly is not a setting upon, even though I would say that there is a certain kind of um, occlusion that occurs when you're only thinking about rivers as um, the standing reserve for fish, for example. Um, but, you know, even this perspective, by virtue of its focus on ecological value, usually occludes other values. And here again, value in ecological terms is usually articulated, I must say, alongside human self-interest. So really here now, I'd like to turn um, to the main sort of part of my of my paper using the example of tibetan riverine systems and in particular the drichu or what what is the headwaters the upper headwaters of the yangtze river i would like to explore another register of value one that is not dependent on the frames use value economic ecological that have hitherto been placed on rivers to do this, I want to detail how Tibetans engage with rivers through their narratives of river names, as well as their descriptions of what rivers do. Paying attention to names acknowledges that a name is usually associated with a discrete entity, like a particular river or stream. This river that you're looking at here is, um, is called the Zhachu, and it's a tributary of the Yangtze. Um, but repeating um, and that names have particular meanings for those who interact with it. But what you find in this particular part of the Tibetan plateau, um, the eastern region that I um, have done my field work in, is that there are often instances of repeating river names across distinct rivers. And I think this somehow reveals something about how Tibetans themselves imagine um, them to be imagine themselves to be connected to a larger historical and cultural whole. So too does greater attention to the descriptions and practices of what rivers do and how they connect, particularly at their headwaters. So um, in what follows, I'd like to um, to sort of leave you the, this lo other lovely image and I, and I will be um, sort of talking to some of these images and maps um, in the next sort of five to ten minutes or so. Now the Yangtze River runs continuously from the Tibetan plateau to the eastern seaboard of China at a length of 6,300 kilometers. It is the third longest river in the world. Now this geological distinction is coupled with the important role that the Yangtze plays and has played in Chinese society and history. More so than its counterpart river to the north, namely the Yellow River, sometimes referred to as China's sorrow, the Yangtze has been the engine of Chinese empires and states for centuries. Its floods have created the ecological conditions for the rich soils necessary for agriculture, and its waterways, with about 416 species of fish, have supported the life of those communities that live along its course. Crucially, the, Yangtze, the Yangtze's consistent hydrological flow, together with its steady course, has allowed it to function as China's highway for centuries, transporting people and goods um, towards the city of Shanghai and thereafter to the South China Sea. Now, geological factors have combined to give the Yangtze this distinction. The parallel mountain ranges, and you can see here, it's in the bottom right, actually, of, of this image, that marks the topography of the upper headwaters of this river, were formed by the movement eastward of the, in, of the Indian subcontinent towards the Chinese plains. This uplifting of the Indian landmass with China created not only the Tibetan plateau, but also the mountain ranges of the eastern plateau. And interestingly, these eastern ranges are additionally characterized by their north-south axis. Where there was topographical resistance, for example, China, the uplifting of the mountain ranges on a north-south axis gave way to a flattening out to the vast lands eastward. These topographical considerations, geological really, considerations shape the, top, the flow of the Yangtze from its rapid north-south descent from the high altitude of the plateau to its subsequent sort of west-east course 
through deep gorges and finally into its enlarged flow into Shanghai. Um, so if you can sort of see a map, and I think I have one here, there you go. This is the upper headwaters, right? And it's really only about the first third of the river. The river then proceeds to just go across the entire west-east um, sort of width of, of China. Uh, and, and fl flowing out into, into Shanghai and the South China Sea. Now, this is a very particular kind of um, uh, um, topographical and geological configuration. This geologic collision between the tectonic plates of India and those of Eurasia, together with the continual uplifting that has produced the Tibetan Plateau, is interestingly a narrative that is echoed by Tibetan themselves and demonstrated in a particular form of Tibetan writing called Nehik or place literature. So in the Nehik or place literature of, a, of, a, of an area called Nienpo Yutse, which is located in what is now Qinghai province, Right, so sort of on this map, you see Yushu or Jekundo, it's really um, sort of uh, east of that um, towards what, what you see as Gansu, east and north. Um, um, I just want to read this quote. And in fact, the, the image here goes with that quote that I'm going to read now. And this is from a Tibetan text, mind you, it's place literature. Um, the, the timing or the dating of this is, um, is sort of unclear but we can sort of say 18th, 19th century. A long time ago, two continents which floated on the surface of ocean collided with each other and raised the Tibetan plateau where the 13 mountain ranges, including Himalaya and 21 snow mountains such as Chumalangma were formed. Gradually, it became the top of the world for which Indians and Chinese called heaven, while Tibetans themselves named it the land of Avalokiteshvara. As the land is pure, the rivers are clear, and the people are kind-hearted. Land the landform of the Tibetan plateau is like leaves of the body tree, where the veins are like mountain ranges, while ancient snow mountains and glaciers are like shiny drops on the face of them." Close quote. I mean, I think that's pretty incredible. And also, it's pretty inc incredible talking to scientists because, um, and, and paleoecologists because, you know, this sort of reference to the ocean, right, this massive inland ocean, of course, references back to the Th Tethys Ocean of, you know, millions and millions of years ago. So I don't know how, how this is coming through in, in the sort of um, oral um, sort of transmission of um, Tibetan uh, culture, but it, 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 this has come through here. So that, and that, that's sort of one of the interesting sort of synergies that we've been finding um, working with uh, classical t Tibetan texts and ethnographies, and then with scientists who are, you know, going into a much different kind of record and data set. So in um, Western geographical terms, the Yangtze is typically referred to in terms of three courses, the upper, middle, and lower. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna speedily go through this because I am running out of time. And I'd like to um, really try to focus a lot more on um, the, the worldly beings um, called the Lu. So all I, I will try to say here is that um, here we have uh, the sort of distinct curve um, and you can see, I think I'll, I'll skip this particular part. We can see here um, what I've tried to do in a uh, sort of, I know it looks like a kindergarten way really, is to highlight for you these repeating river names. So first of all, what I want to say is what is a single name in English for the Yangtze actually has different names in Tibetan and Chinese. So the Chinese itself, what you will see is that yellow highlighted squiggle, right? That, that's, the, that's the Yangtze and the upper headwaters um, called the Dritcher in Tibetan, and that keeps its name in Tibetan. But in Chinese, that name changes about three times. It goes, it's first called the Tuo He, and then the Tong Tian He, and then it's called the Jinsha, which basically means golden sands, to, to do with the yellow color of the river itself. And then only at at Yibin, which you can see on the map there, does it become the Changjiang, which is um, what is the name of, of, the, of the Yangtze, I suppose, in Chinese. And so these four names are really referring to this one river, but at different, at different locations. Um, the Tibetan name, Dritcha, um, Dri is the um, Tibetan word for wild female yak. And 
what for the Tibetans is uh, most important in terms of, of a river, and in, in fact, the, the sort of um, importance of a river is to know its source. And so the, the story that goes with the Dritcha is that the, the source of the Dritcha is really um, at the so, sort of a, a rock place for which stood a mythical female wild yak um, with water coming from her mouth. And, and that is the kind of the, the origin name of, of the Dritcha. And this is why it's called um, the Dritcha. If we look at the tributaries here, and I've highlighted in red and in blue, the red tributary um, is called the Dzatcha, and that's the photograph or the image that I showed you earlier. But interestingly, of course, that name doesn't keep its same Tibetan name throughout the length of that river. It's the Dzatcha only up until a certain point, and then the name changes to Nyakcha after a certain point. But what I want to point out here is that the Dzatcha is also the name of the river West, which has that red squiggle line, which is, which is the upper headwaters of the Mekong, right? So what we have here is a phenomenon of repeating river names. So they're calling, Tibetans are calling two distinct rivers, two different things. And they're actually referring to the, um, the original Dzatcha. So the Dzatcha that is in Chamdo, that is um, sort of west. And this Dzatcha is named after that. Right, so there's a, you know, there's a kind of recognition that, um, that river names are sort of jumping over quite high mountain ranges as well, if you can imagine um, what's going on here. The similar thing with um, the blue squiggle line on the right, which is the Jamungulcha, also another tributary of the Yangtze. And that name, Jamungulcha, basically refers to um, the, the uh, silver river of the queen. Right? And, and that refers to the queendom that, was, that is located on this right part um, of, the, of the map. But if you'll see the repeating blue or the mirroring blue, which is the headwaters of the Salween River, is also called in Tibetan the Jamungulcha. But it's called the Lu, um, the Western Jamungulcha. And interestingly, in that region, in Tibetan history of the 6th century, there was the only other queendom recorded um, of, Tibetan, of the Tibetan Empire, and that is the, um, the queendom of uh, the Sumpa, right? So here we've got a kind of a deliberate referencing and connection um, of, the, of the Eastern Jamungulcha and the people who live to the uh, east of, of this um, sort of, of the Dritcha, I suppose, um, with the um, sha, with the Lo Jamungucha, which is the Western Jamungucha, the headwaters of the Salween. I hope I've just here sort of demonstrated a little bit how um, the, the phenomenon of repeating river names is, is quite um, a remarkable one, I would think. Um, and it's something that Tibetans themselves sort of note and reference. It, it makes them, it situates them as um, uh, knowingly, self referentially part of a larger. Um, cultural whole and connected to a larger cultural whole. So I'll just continue here. So for Tibetans, their rivers clearly provide a backdrop for a sense of a wider cultural imaginary with regard to connections. Now the Tibetan word for connections is drewa, and it's frequently invoked when telling narratives of large river names. But additionally, what is a river for Tibetans and how precisely does it connect? Rivers are called ch in Tibetan. And um, this is quite a general term. There are more specific terms to include like, you know, large or small rivers, calm or slow rivers, um, streams, as well as streams in valleys. But significantly, this same word ch also means water. And it is this sense of the primary role of water in all life that also pervades a sense of rivers. So for example, the Tibetan blogger Wusa now, writes that the Buddhist master Atisa praised the pureness of Tibet's waters, quote, taste a mouthful of the waters of the land of snows. It is ice cold and tasty, fresh and pure, clear and fragrant. When one drinks it, it will not hurt one's spleen or stomach, but it will moisten one's heart. This is Tibetan water with its eight virtues, close quote. 
when rivers are close to their source or headwaters, they embody the qualities of Tibetan water. As rivers proceed downstream and importantly, pass along and through human settlements, they become increasingly dirty, both in a physical sense and polluted in, in a sort of sense of value. And the word here um, for pollution um, and that I use throughout for the rest of this um, paper is drip and drip means shadow, sort of like a, sh a shadow, right, that's being cast. Um, for Tibetans too, not all water comes from rivers, clearly. There are seven types of water, namely water from rain, from snow, from river, from spring, from well, salt, water from roots. But then there is also this um, other thing which is called miraculous water or attainment water, drip -ch that Tibetans will drink and place on their heads. Miraculous water is thought to be an outcome of the treasure revelations of a tantric master, such as Atisa, um, but they also sort of um, spontaneously arise out of rocks. And I'm here I'm just going to read another quote uh, from the text of two tantric masters, Drime Odze and Serakandro, who highlight how um, they brought forth uh, this emergent, um, this um, uh, drupcha, this miraculous water. At that time, quote, at that time, the aroma of a good smell permeated the valley. Miraculous water sprang forth from the treasure site. The earth quaked, a sound came forth. And since then I have extracted miraculous water in the manner of a treasure. Everyone tasted it. It is the accomplishment of this place. I extracted a self-emergent spring from a dry rock like this, close quote. So miraculous water is thought to cause well-being. Drinking it, putting it over one's head, brings fortune and well-being from illness. In this way, it is part of an imaginary of actions associated with cleansing and purity in Tibetan life worlds. But just as humans benefit from cleansing and purifying, so too does a class of beings in Tibetan cosmology known as worldly deities. Now these worldly deities, called Jikten Pa Ila, are different from the more commonly known transcendental deities such as bodhisattvas of the strictly Buddhist pantheon. The main difference is that worldly deities dwell in the world, usually in holy places such as mountains and lakes, um, and are subject to the effects of anthropogenic activities. Thought to originate from folk indigenous religions prior to the adoption of Buddhism from India, worldly deities are said to have been tamed by Indian tantric masters such as Padmasambhava to, in order to serve the Buddhist Dharma. But importantly, because they live in the world, they not only feel the effects of human activities um, through actions that pollute or purify, but they also feel anger, jealousy, beneficence as a result of these actions. Great illness may be inflicted by worldly deities, as can great fortune be bestowed. There are different categories of such deities, those that live in high places, those that live on ground level, and those that live in subterranean places or underwater. And it is this last category um, to which the Lu belong. Now, Lu direct, also directly originate from India, right? And they sort of have a precedent in the Indic Naga, water serpent beings that are also found in many other cultures, including Aboriginal Australia. Tibetans say that rivers, and especially the headwaters because of their cleanliness, are the abode of Lu. Lu are territorial about their abodes and if inflict illness, mainly in the form of leprosy and boils, on those who threaten their abode or who anger them by, you know, sort of um, unclean actions and activities. Yet the key to Tibetan relationships with worldly deities, such as the Lu, lies in the connection or interdependence between them. The actions of one materially affect the other and vice versa, simultaneously. Um, and to highlight this, I really like to read an excerpt from a ritual text um, associated with um, the practice of smoke uh, purification. So this is um, the, the practice of burning ju juniper or other fragrant herbs in order to purify. And the purification here is of not only of um, the, the water, that in fact not the water itself, it, the purification is of the lu, of the worldly beings. Um, and I just really, I, just to give you a sense of it, um, 
uh, it's not going to take very long. Oh, look, as a result of these purifying offerings to you, may all contagious diseases among human beings cease. May all financial loss and ruin come to an end. May the sea demons who plague horses be eliminated and may diseases of the sheep be brought to an end. We offer nourishing nectar-like medicine. If there is disease, today let it be purified. If there is impurity, today let it be purified. If there is contamination, today let it be purified. This purifying sun turns dry stone into gold. This purifying sun causes dead trees to sprout new branches. To the 360 lu we offer. To the 21,000 beneficial lu we offer. To the Lu who guard the treasury of all that is desirable, we offer. To the Lu who increase livestock, we offer. And to the Lu who increase prosperity, we offer. So it kind of goes on. I, I, I wish I could read it all to you. Um, and then there's another part of this uh, ritual um, chant um, and this text, which is, by the way, a 17th century ritual text um, written by Karma Chakmit, who is um, a, a, a Lama of the Kagyu sect of Tibetan Buddhism and who actually originates from an area in Eastern Tibet, not very far, in fact, from where this photograph was taken. But I wanted to um, sort of just note this particular thing, which is that the Lu themselves have illnesses, right? And, and this image, in fact, I've sent it to Katie, um, is, is one that details all the different illnesses that l the Lu can have themselves. And in fact, by purifying them, by making all these specific offerings, you are targeting, it's almost like medicine, you're targeting particular sort of illnesses. Um, I'm just going to read through it, you know, of the tongue and the teeth. Um, of the indigenous, uh, of the, um, sorry, of the in, uh, digestive system, of um, the head sickness, um, of the kidneys, you know, so all, all of these are detailed in the particular text. And what all of this, I think, points to is um, the very clear sort of interdependence um, between Tibetans and Le, that when we cleanse the Le of their ailments through purifying smoke, Tibetans are not only healing the Le, but they're also at the same time bringing great fortune and benefit to themselves. And it's simultaneous. The, the one act does um, sort of encompasses the other. And the connection between the Tibetans and Le, in fact, mediate all aspects of daily practical life for both of them. I'll just um, sort of go towards my conclusion. So sorry, it's uh, sort of longer than I thought. But this associated concerns um, of purity or cleanliness and pollution at the source of rivers are further underscored by what and how rivers connect. For some communities um, that live along the Dritsha and the Dzatcha rivers, several ritual actions connected to rivers are usually performed by local people and monasteries. The first is a periodic cleansing of water in order to appease the local lu. Um, and in one nomadic community of Dzatchika, nomads invited a local lama to perform a ritual to consecrate a latse at the headwaters of a local river because there was leprosy in the community. And now a latse is a can of earth and stone that's used to propitiate offerings to local territorial or worldly deities. During the final part of the ritual, uh, the lama placed the stone on top of the latse. And after the ritual, it was reported that the stone fell into the water and killed a snake. After that, the local community was free from leprosy. So this is one of the sort of um, stories that were told to me. Another way that river water is cleansed not necessarily at the headwaters, is to place mani stones underwater. Now, these mani stones are any kind of flat rock or stone that's been carved with a chant, usually on Manabenhom, and they function like wind horses, you know, those prayer flags that you see um, you know, sort of in inner city, in a Melbourne or Sydney sort of terrace houses um, that are meant to disperse blessings. And but the interesting thing here is that the money stones, when they are put underwater, function as something called sir zampa or golden bridges. And so instead of spreading blessings, which is what they would do if it were out of the water, when they're submerged within the water, they actually cleanse the water or the river itself. And of course, um, as you might know, I had to put the, the image of the lungta or the prayer flags um, here. 
the associated with rivers is that they're spreading blessings, right? When the lungda or the money stones are placed above water or on the, on the ground, they effectively carry blessings um, on them downstream. What I'd like to conclude from these significant and intentional actions along and with rivers is an emphasis on the act of connecting or connections, drilwa. The connection itself reveals difference, right? Or in this case, distance between purity and pollution, between upstream and downstream. Tibetans are very clear about this, not only about understanding what's done upstream impacts what happens downstream, right? So don't, don't pee close to the, a stream because the stream flows down and there are households downstream. I mean, that's just a practical way, but also about how a flow of water might be sort of symbolically clean before it enters any kind of human settlement and then dirty after it leaves these settlements. On the roof of the world, close to the pure source of rivers that inevitably flow out of the Tibetan plateau and therefore connect Tibetans to larger, albeit unknown worlds, there is an integral sense that movement and flow of these rivers, namely their ability to connect is what makes them important and in some ways sacred, even though the sense of this word is, as I've said before, much different from the sacredness of the Hindu Ganga or even of the holiness of Tibetan Buddhist lakes and mountains. So what else is the value of a river? In fact, what is a river? since rivers are hydrologically and symbolically complex networks rather than the squiggly blue line that we normally locate on maps. Repeating river names in Tibet, I think, points less to a focus on discreetly identified identity, identities and more to the narratives and, and connections, imagined connections across the plateau. And in this brief conclusion, I'd like to return to the idea of river as subject. Now, while I appreciate the intent of the authors of that collected volume to rescue rivers from the appropriation of certain frames of value, economic, ecological, instrumental, I also wonder if the value of subject is the best that we can do. In thinking through my own materials, I have to, I have to ask, what about value framed within terms understandable and important to Tibetans themselves? Again, I think I'd go back to saying, well, in fact, the value is the connection. And to be more specific than that, it's a certain kind of connection um, known as tendril or dependent origination. I don't have time to elaborate on tendril. I'm actually gonna be talking about it in another seminar in a couple of weeks. But to understand tendril is to understand that all phenomena arise in dependence on each other. Therefore, the human organism is a unity. It's not separate from its environment since all aspects of the organism are part of this universal process of dependent origination. One could say that Tibet's rivers express tendril in several ways as abodes of the Lu, for which connections with Tibetans are in continual process of interdependence, as a source of water with its eight virtuous qualities that are restorative to humans, and as a way to spread blessings and fortunes, even as the source and the method are constantly themselves subject to dirt and dust and pollution from human actions. I think I'm going to end my paper here. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Apologies for going over time. Thank you very much, Gillian. That was um, very lovely, very interesting. Um, and we do also apologise for starting late, which also indicates why you maybe we're a little <laughs> going over time a little bit. Um, we will go to questions and perhaps it's easiest if you do use your reaction bar and raise your um, digital hand um, and that way I can keep track of who wants to ask a question. Katie. Yeah, Katie, go for it. Thanks, Julia. That was as gorgeous as your papers always are. Um, I'm really fascinated in the collaboration across such diverse disciplines. <laughs> and I mean, you know, from I think all of us would be interested in how it sort of all originated, what kinds of relationships and, you know, how that all sort of worked out. But then I think, you know, there's always, I think, for 
like I, and I also really want to know how it's impacted you and the way that you're sort of analysing things and whether there's been sort of negotiations around interpretation. And, you know, I could see there'd be a temptation for a structural functionalist sort of approach to come in um, or, or sort of pragmatic ideas around, you know, I mean, you spoke about sort of, um, you know, retribution for lack of cleanliness, you know, resulting in curses and things like boils where someone could say, well, if you, you know, there's hygiene issues, blah, 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 or you're talking about rocks, um, as purifying water, which again, you know, um, an ecologist would like to look at that quite literally. So I'm, just, so I'm just really interested in how those kinds of dynamics have played out within the research team and what you've learned in this kind of collaboration. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, look, I don't, I, I have thought about this and I, and I don't mean for this to come out in any uh, sort of way as, as condescending, but we are working with a group of quite tame scientists. <laughs> and, and by this, by this, I mean, um, Firstly, that the project was conceived by humanities and social sciences, right? And we invited them to join us, right? So, so the, the sort of um, the driver really is um, uh, classical Tibetan, I have to say, more so than anthropology um, and Tibetan studies. Uh, and and the, the scientists have been invite, invited to, to join us. They have not been able to go into um, any of these areas because of COVID, I have to say. I was the only one of the project that managed to. Um, but in a sense, um, they, they're tame because they're, they're open as well. You know, um, they themselves are extremely interested um, to learn, uh, not just to hear, but to learn about the loo, um, to learn about um, a flood control um, practices of the Tibetan Empire, you know, back in even as, as far as the records can, uh, can the written records um, can give us. And so there, there's a kind of uh, lovely synergy, I have to say, in this regard. Um, and, oh yes, perhaps they are wild scientists, untamed by their disciplines. Yes, true. Um, they're not techno scientists, I, I would say, you know, they, they really, and, and, and what else has been really interesting is um, sort of co-reading certain kinds of scientific literature which you can imagine is is just about it's it's kind of like it's not just environmental determinism it's climate determinism <laughs> you know it, it's you, you you don't actually have a data set to make this rigorous enough to make these sorts of claims and actually to be able to read those texts with them um allows us to see where the science where even the science falls down Right, rather more more so than the than the logical processes about what you can claim based on certain kinds of data, and so and so that's been edifying, I must say. Uh, so we haven't yet got to a point where there's been a whole lot of argy bargy. I think that there could be. I mean, I'm already picking up. There's there's one guy. He's um at ANU, the surface quite renowned surface water hydrologist, who's wor worked a lot on the Brahmaputra, and in fact, his tendency is to kind of overly romanticize indigenous environmental practices right and to say no it's not jum agriculture that's the, that's wrong you know it's actually colonial policy it actually makes a lot of sense but at the same time uh it, it, it's kind of trying to rein him in a little bit <laughs> to say no actually but jum does have its problems as well you know it's kind of like slash and burn actually also does have its problems right so we, we want to take a kind of more sort of moderate view uh both ways <laughs> so so it's been a generally positive experience i must say um, but mainly because they are biddable. <laughs> Is that the word? <laughs> it's the word that we use for dogs. Thank you for that. Um, Greg. Thanks, Gillian. That, that, that was really inspirational. Um, and my question is um, more with regard to the, to, the, to the content of the research rather than the, the, um, the dynamics of co-production. Yep. You've emphasized in this kind of transition from purity to polluting, upstream, downstream, the human element, that humans cause pollution. Rivers get dirty as they go through human settlements and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, are there any other recognized sources of pollution? Like you mentioned the Lu suffer mm -hmm. illnesses and such. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what causes those illnesses? Uh, is it human you've, you've mentioned anthropogenic activity several times yeah. but are there other sources of of pollution of becoming dirty and such or, or are humans exceptional in, um, in terms yeah, of the that's, that's a great question i would say that humans are pretty exceptional 
um, with regard to uh, the worldly deities, right? With regard to the Lu or, or with the Jikten, which are associated with, um, sorry, the Jibdak, they're associated more with mountains. Um, so, you know, even things like um, spitting, uh, not washing your face before you approach any of these things. I mean, th these are, these are um, polluting activities. And, and I use the word polluting, which is drip, and not the word sin, which is digpa, because a lot of these actions are registered not according to a Buddhist framework. Right, so it's, there's no mention here about sin or karma or you know any of, of those sorts of more familiar or merit even it, it, none of those words come up. It's really about um, pollution, about uncleanliness, um, and and a, a lot of that is um, according to um, Tibetan studies anyway because of this um, lineage back to pre-Buddhist um, indigenous uh, deities. Right, so, so that's, that's part of it. But having said that, there are another class of demons, of beings that are demons, that can cause um, havoc, shall we say, in some, in some sense. Um, it's not pollution in the same way, but they cause havoc. They don't do that uh, to other, to other um, worldly beings, but they do do it to humans. So humans can be acted on by these demons, um, and there's there's sort of a, as well. I love the symmetry of uh, Tibetan categories: eight levels of of demons, you know, and and these eight will inflict um, uh, sort of illness, poisons, you know, misfortune, death in all these different ways, um, but but to humans as well. So there is a certain centrality, I think, of human action to this matrix. And in, in that sense also, I, I am just thinking through my own work, um, I find the more than, you know, the post-human literature doesn't, doesn't work um, in, some, in, some, in many ways, right? Thank you. Nearly forgot to unmute there. Um, it is three o'clock. So I do suggest we leave it there. We can leave the space open if people want to hang around and um, uh, grill Gillian for some more questions. Um, it's been a fascinating talk. Thank you very much, Gillian. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you for staying with me and for even being here. Um, very grateful to that for you. Yeah, it was lovely and it was refreshing. So thank you. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, next week, we do have two presenters. Uh, one is Domenico Volpicella. He's... Um, currently in Italy, I believe, so he will also be zooming in. And we also have Tania Phillips, who is an honours student. Um, so we will be, just for ease of presentation, we will be doing that on Zoom as well. Um, and I do believe that is all for this week. So I wish you all a good weekend. And hope you get some hug rest. To everyone. <laughs> Thank From you, Julia, that was beautiful. Thank you so much, it was just gorgeous. Bye, see you in another space. Yeah, okay, bye now.